The Starlight Lounge presents An Evening with the Progressive Box. Oh, what a great audience. Let's dim the lights for this next one. Oh, too much. Ah, there it is. Got to get things just right. Like Progressive's Name Your Price tool. Tell us what you want to pay, and we help you find coverage options that fit your budget. And now, the mood is right. Wait, the lights are back on again. Trudy, can you? And now it's completely dark. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Price and coverage match limited by state law. Welcome back to part two of the Armenian Genocide. This is your host, Andrew Knight, from the Brief History Podcast. As ever, please share, review our podcast, find us on social media or on Facebook, that's facebook.com forward slash Brief History, or on Twitter at B History Podcast. Please talk to us on there. Uh, we'd love to find out what you think. Let me know if you've got any ideas of the, the next episodes we can record and uh, keep uh, keep talking to us. Thanks for your review so far. We will recap on uh, part one of the Brief History podcast, The Armenian Genocide. The Armenian Genocide, also known as the Armenian Holocaust, with the Ottoman government systematic extermination of 1.5 million Armenians mostly citizens within the Ottoman Empire and its successor state, the Republic of Turkey. The starting date is conventionally held to be the 24th of April 1915, the day that the Ottoman authorities rounded up and arrested and deported from Constantinople, which is now Istanbul, to the region of Ankara, 235 to 270 Armenian intellectuals and community leaders the majority of whom were eventually murdered. The genocide was carried out during and after World War I and implemented in two phases. The first, the whole-scale killing of the able-bodied male population through massacre and subjection of army conscripts to forced labour, followed by the deportation of women, children and the elderly and the interim on death marches leading to the Syrian desert. Driven forward by military escorts, the deportees were deprived of food and water and subjected to periodic robbery, rape and massacre. Other ethnic groups were similarly targeted for extermination in the Assyrian Genocide and the Greek Genocide, and their treatment is considered by some historians to be part of the same genocidal policy. Most Armenian diaspora communities around the world came into being as a direct result of this genocide. Raphael Lemkin was moved specifically by the annihilation of the Armenians to define the systematic and premeditated exterminations with legal parameters and coined the word genocide in 1943. The Armenian genocide is acknowledged to have been one of the most, the, one of the first modern genocides because scholars point to the organised manner in which the killings were carried out. It is the second most studied case of genocide after the Holocaust. Turkey denies the word genocide and is an accurate term of these crimes, though in recent years Turkey has been faced with repeated calls to recognise this as a genocide. As of 2018, 29 countries officially recognised the mass killings as genocide, and as most genocides and scholars and historians do. The Committee of Union of Progress founded the special organisation that participated in the destruction of the Ottoman Armenian community. This organisation adapted its name in 1913 and functioned like a special forces outfit. 
Later in 1914, Ottoman government influenced the direction of the special organisation by releasing criminals from central prisons to be central elements of this newly funded and formed special organisation. According to the Mezar commissions attached to the tribunal, as soon as November 1914, 124 criminals were released from Boyan prison. Little by little, from the end of 1914 to the beginning of 1915, hundreds then thousands of prisoners were freed to form members of this organisation. Later they were charged with escorting the convoys of the Armenian deportees. Vihad Pasha commanded the Ottoman Third Army called those members of the special organisations the, quote, butchers of the human species, end quote. Eton Belkin was a nearly member who infiltrated the Ottoman army as an official. He was assigned to the headquarters of Kemal Pasha, who witnessed the burning of 5,000 Armenians. Lieutenant Hassan Maruf of the Ottoman army describes how a population of villages were taken altogether and then burned. The commander of the Third Army's Viheb 12 page affidavit was dated the 15th of December 1918, was, was presented to the Terazbon trial series on the 29th of March 1919, included in the key indictment, reporting such as mass murder and burning of the population of an entire village, village near Mus. Quote, the shortish method for disposing of the women and children concentrated in the various camps were to burn them, end quote. Further, it was reported that, quote, Turkish prisoners had apparently witnessed some of these scenes were horrified and maddened at remembering the sight. They told the Russians that, that the stench of burning human fresh flesh permeated the air for many days after, end quote. Genocide scholar Vekem Drian wrote that 80,000 Armenians in 90 villages across the Mush Plain were burned in stables and haylofts. Trabzon was the main city in Trabzon province. Oscar S. Heiser, the American consul at Trabzon, reported, quote, This plan did not suit Nile Bay. Many of the children were loaded into boats and taken out to sea and thrown overboard. As if men met. A Turkish deputy serving Trabzon testified during the 21st of December 1918 parliamentary session of the Chambers of Deputies that, quote, the district governors loaded the Armenians into barges, barges and had them thrown overboard, end quote. The Italian, Italian consul of Trabzon in 1915, Giacomo Guarini states, Quote, I saw thousands of innocent women and children placed on boats which were capsized in the Black Sea. End quote. Dragian places the number of Armenians killed in the Trabzon province by drowning at 50,000. The Trabzon trials reported that Armenians have been thrown in on drowned in the Black Sea. According to a testimony, women and children were loaded into boats to be drowned in the sea. Hoffman Philip, the American charge of the affairs at Constantinople, wrote, quote, Boatloads sent from Zor down the river arrived at Anna, when 30 miles away with three fifths of passengers missing. End quote. According to Robert Fisk, 90,000 Armenian women were drowned in Biltilis, while in Ezrakan, the corpse in the Euphrates resulted in a change in the course of the river for a few hundred metres. Drajian also wrote that countless Armenians were drowned in Euphrates and their tributaries. Ottoman ph physicians contributed to the planning and the execution of the genocide. The physicians Bediyana Shikar and Nezem Bey were leading figures in the leadership committee of the Committee of Union and Progress. Both held leadership roles in the special organisation. Other physicians used their medical expertise to facilitate the killings, including designing methods for poisoning victims and using Armenians as subjects for lethal human extermination. Drajian argued that systematic medical murders in the Armenian genocide was a precursor to Nazi human experimentation during the Holocaust. Specific, specific medical methods used to kill victims include morphine overdoses, 
join the Trabzon trial series of the Marshall Court from the sittings between the 26th of March and the 19th of May 1919. Trabzon Health Services Inspector Dr. Zia Ford wrote in a report that Dr. Sayab caused the death of children with the injection of morphine. The information was allegedly provided by two physicians, Drs. Rabhab and Zihab. Both Dr. Siab's colleagues at Trabzon's Red Crescent Hospital, where these atrocities were said to be committed. Toxic gas. Dr. Zaya Freya and Dr. Adanam, Public Health Services Directors at Trabzon, submitted affidavits reporting cases in which two school buildings were used to organise children and send them to mezzanine to kill them with toxic gas equipment. Typhoid inoculation. The Ottoman surgeon Dr. Haydn Kemal wrote, Quote, on the order of the Chief Sanitation Office of the Third Army in January 1916, when the spread of typhus was an acute problem, innocent Armenians slated for deportation at Erzikam were inoculated with the blood of typhoid fever patients without rendering the blood inactive. End quote. Jeremy Hugh Barron writes, quote, Individual doctors were directly involved in massacres, having poisoned infants, killed children, and issued false certificates of death from natural causes. Nazim's brother-in-law, Dr. Trevik Rushdu, Inspector General of Health Services, organised the disposal of Armenian corpses with thousands of kilos of lime over six months. He became Foreign Secretary from the 19th 1925 to 1938. The Treku law brought some measures regarding the property of deportees and on the 13th of September 1915 the Ottoman Parliament passed the temporary law of expropriation and confiscation stating that all property including land, livestock and homes belonging to Armenians was to be confiscated by authorities. Ottoman parliamentary representative Ahmed Rizzo protested this legislation. Quote, it is unlawful to designate the Armenian assets as abandoned goods. For the Armenians, the proprietors did not abandon their properties voluntarily. They were forcibly compulsorily removed from their domiciles and exiles. Now the government, through its efforts in selling these goods, if we, if we are a constitutional, constitutional regime in functioning in accordance with constitutional law, we cannot do this. This is atrocious. Grab my arm, eject me from my village, then sell my goods and properties. Such a thing can never be permissible. Even the consequence of the Ottomans, nor the law, cannot allow it. End quote. During the Paris Peace Conference, the Armenian delegation presented an assessment of 3.7 billion, which is about 52 billion today, worth of material losses owned solely by the Armenian Church. The Armenian community then presented an additional demand for the reconstitution of property and assets seized by the Ottoman government. The joint declaration which was submitted to the Supreme Council by the Armenian delegation and prepared by religious leaders of the Armenian community claimed that the Ottoman government had destroyed 2,000 churches and 20 monasteries and had provided a legal system for giving these properties to other parties. The declaration also provided financial assessment of the total losses of personal property and assets of both Turkish and Russian Armenia with 14 billion 598 million 500,000 francs respectively totaling to an estimated 339 billion dollars today. Furthermore, the Armenian community asked for the restoration of church-owned property and reimbursement of its generated income. The Ottoman government never responded to the declaration and so restitution did not occur. 
by the early 1930s all properties belonging to the Armenians were subject to deportation had been confiscated. Since then no restitution of property confiscated during the Armenian genocide has taken place. Historians argue that the mass confiscation of Armenian properties was an important factor in form the economic basis of the Turkish Republic while endowing Turkey's economy with capital. The mass confiscation of properties provided the opportunity for ordinary lower caste Turks, i.e. the peasantry, soldiers and labourers, to rise to the ranks of the middle class. Contemporary Turkish historian Ugar Ungar asserts that the elimination of the Armenian population left the state an infrastructure of Armenian property which was used for the progress of Turkish settler communities. In other words, the consecration of the Etetish Turkish national economy was unthinkable without the destruction and exportation of the Armenians. On the night of the 2nd of November 1918, and with the aid of Ahmet Izzat Pasha, the three Pashas, which included Mehmed Talat Pasha and Ismail Enver, the main proprietors of the genocide, fled the Ottoman Empire. In the 1919, after Mendrus Armistice, Sultan Mehmed VI was ordered to organise court martial by the Allied administration in charge of Constantinople to try members of the Committee of Union of Progress, the CUP, for taking the Ottoman Empire into World War I. By January 1919, a report to Sultan Mehmed VI accused over 130 suspects, most of which were high officials. Sultan Mehmed VI and Grand Vizier Damat Fred Pasha as representatives of the government of the Ottoman Empire during the Second Constitution in Era were summoned to the Paris Peace Conference by US Secretary of State Robert Lansing. On the 11th of July 1919, Damet Fered Pasha officially confessed to massacres against the Armenians in the Empire, Ottoman Empire and was a key figure and initiator of the war crimes trial which held directly after World War I to condemn the death and the chief perpetrators of the genocide. The military court found that it was the will of the CUP to eliminate the Armenians physically via its special organisation. The 1919 pronouncement reads as follows. Quote, the court martial taken into consideration the above named crimes declares unanimously the culpability as principal factor of these crimes, the fugitive Talat Pasha, former Grand Visor, Enver and Findi, former War Minister, struck off the reg of the Imperial Army, Kemal Effendi, former Navy Minister, struck off two from Imperial Army and Dr. Nazim Effendi, former Ministers of Education, members of the General Council of the Union and Progress, representing the moral person of that party. The court martial pronounces in accordance with said stipulations of the law the death penalty against Talat Enver, Kemal and Dr. Nazim. End quote. After the pronouncement, the three Pashas were sentenced to death in absentia at the trials in Constantinople. The court marshals officially disbanded the CUP and confiscated its assets and the assets of those found guilty. The court marshals were dismissed, dismissed in August 1920 for the lack of transparency, according to High Commissioner and Admiral Sir John de Robeck, and some of those accused were deported to Tumulta for further interrogation, only to be released afterwards in exchange of POWs. Two of the three Pashas were later assassinated by Armenian vigilantes during Operation Nemesis. Ottoman military members and high-ranking politicians convicted by the Turkish court marshals were transferred from Constantinople prisons to the Crown Colony of Malta on board SS Princess Enna and HMS Benbow by the British forces starting in 1919. Admiral Sir Somerset Gough Carthorpe was in charge of the operation together with Lord Curzon, 
they did so owing to the lack of transparency of the Turkish court martials. They held there for three years while searches were made of archives in Constantinople, London, Paris and Washington to find a way to put them in trial. However, the war criminals were eventually released without trial and returned to Constantinople in 1921 in exchange for 22 British prisoners of war held by the government in Ankara, including a relative of Lord Curzon. The government in Ankara was opposed to political power of government in Constantinople. They were often mentioned as the Malta exiles in sources. Meanwhile, the peace conference in Paris established a commission on responsibilities and sanctions in January 1919, which was commissioned by United States of Secretary of State Robert Lanzin. Based on the commissioners' work, several articles were added to the Treaty of Sivres. The Treaty of Sivres was a planned tri trial in August 1920 to determine those responsible for, quote, the barbarous and illiterate methods of warfare, including an offence against the laws and customs of war and the principles of humanity, end quote. Article 2. Th Thirty of the Treaty of the Severs required the Ottoman Empire hand over the Arab powers, the persons responsible for the massacres committed during the war on the 1st of August 1914. According to European Court of Human Rights, Judge Giovanni Belloni, the suspension of prosecution attempts and the release and repatriation of detainees was, amongst others, a result of the lack of appropriate legal framework with supranational jurisdiction. Following World War I, no international norms for regulating war crimes existed due to a legal vacuum in international law. Therefore, contrary to Turkish sources, no trials were ever held in Malta. On the 15th of March 1921, former Grand Visor Talat Pasha was assassinated in Charlottesburg district of Berlin, Germany in broad daylight and in the presence of many witnesses. Talat's death was part of Operation Nemesis, the Armenian Revolutionary Federation's codename for their covert operation in the 1920s to kill the planners of the Armenian Genocide. The subsequent trial and acquittal of the assassin Sokhomon Teleranian had an important influence on Raphael Lemkin, a lawyer of Polish Jewish descent who campaigned in the League of Nations to ban what he called barbarity and vandalism. The term genocide created in 1943 was coined by Lemkin, who was directly influenced by the massacres of Armenians during World War I. The Armenian Committee for Armenian and Syrian Relief the ACARSR, also known as Near East Release, established in 1915, just after the deportations began, was a charitable organisation established to relieve the suffering of the people of the Near East. The organisation was championed by American Ambassador Henry Morgenthau Sr. Morgenthau's dispatches on the mass slaughter of Armenians galvanised such support for an organisation. In its first year, the NCRNE carried, carried for 132,000 Armenian orphans from Tiflis, Yevaran, Constantinople, Sivas, Beirut, Damascus and Jerusalem. A relief organisation for refugees in the Middle East helped donate over $102 million to Armenians both during and after the war. Between 1915 to 1930, ACRNE distributed humanitarian relief to locations across a wide geographical range, eventually spreading over 10 times its regional estate and helping around 22 million refugees. While there is no consensus how many Armenians lost their lives during the Armenian Genocide, there is a general agreement among Western historians that over 800,000 Armenians died between 1914 and 1918. Estimates vary between 800,000 and 1.5 million per governments of France, Canada and other states. 
Encyclopedia Britannica references the research of an Arnold J. Toynbee, an intelligence officer of the British Foreign Office, who estimated that 600 million or 600,000 Armenians died or was massacred during deportation in a report compiled on the 24th of May 1916. This figure, however, accounts for solely the first year of the genocide and does not take into account those who died or were killed after May 1916. According to documents that once belonged to Talat Pasha, more than 970,000 Ottoman Armenians disappeared from official population record records from 1915 to 1916. In 1983, Talat's widow, Hayriya Talat Berefidi, gave the documents and records to Turkish journalist Murat Bardiki, who published them in a book titled The Remaining Documents of Talat Pasha also known as Talat Pasha's Black Book. According to the documents, the number of Armenians living in the Ottoman Empire between 1915 stood at 1,256,000. It was presumed, however, in the footnote by Talat Pasha himself that Armenian population was undercounted by 30%. Furthermore, the population of Protestant Armenians was not taken into account. Therefore, according to historian Arasha Farin, the population of Armenians should have been approximately 1.7 million prior to the start of the war. However, that number was plunged to 284,157 two years later in 1917. While Ottoman consensuses claimed an Armenian population of 1.2 million, Faz al Gashin wrote there was about 1.9 million Armenians in the Ottoman Empire, and some modern scholars estimated over 2 million. German official Max Erwin von Schneidner wrote that fewer than 100,000 Armenians survived the genocide, the rest had been exterminated. During the 1920s, Turkish Armenian War, 60,000 to 98,000 Armenian civilians were estimated to be killed by the Turkish army. Some estimates put the total number of Armenian massacred in the hundreds of thousands. Dardrian characterized the massacre in the Corsicas as a, quote, miniature genocide. Hundreds of eyewitnesses include diplomats from neutral United States and the Ottoman Empire's own allies Germany and Austria-Hungary recorded and document numerous acts of state-sponsored massacres. Many foreign officials offered to intervene on behalf of the Armenians, including Pope Benedict XV, only to, to be turned away by Ottoman government officials who claimed they were retaliating against a pro-Russian insertion. On the 24th of May 1915, the Triple Entente warned the Ottoman Empire that, quote, in view of these new crimes of Turkey against humanity and civilization, the Allah government's announcement publicly to sublime port that it will help be responsible for these crimes. All members of the Ottoman government, as well as those of their agents, were implicated in such massacres, end quote. The United States had consulates throughout the Ottoman Empire, including locations in Indira, Alzag, Samson, Izmir, Trebizond, Van, Constantinople and Aleppo. It was officially a neutral party and never declared war on the Ottoman Empire. In addition to the consulates, there were numerous American Protestant missionaries compounds established in Armenian populated religious regions, including Van and Karput. The atrocities were reported regularly in newspapers and literary journals across the world. On his return home in 1924, after 30 years as a US consul in the Near East and most of the preceding decade, a consul general at Simrana, George Horton, wrote his own quote, account of the systematic extermination of the Christian population, populations by Mohammedans and the culpability of the certain great powers with a true story of the burning of Saimra, quote. Horton's account quoted numerous contemporary communications and eyewitness reports, including one of the massacre of Pro in 1914 by a Frenchman and two of the Armenian massacres of 1914-15 by American citizen and a German missionary.
It also quoted U.S. businessman Walter M. Gaides regarding his time in Damascus. Several Turks whom I interviewed told me that the motive of this exile was to exterminate the race. Many Americans spoke out against the genocide, including former presidents Theodore Roosevelt, Rabbi Stephen Wise, Alice Stone, Bakewell, and William Jennings Bryan, the U.S. Secretary of State, to June 15. In the U.S. and United Kingdom, children will regularly remain reminded to clean their plates while eating and remember and to remember the starving Armenians. As the orders for deportations and massacres were enacted, many consular officials reported they were witness to Ambassador Henry Morgan and the Senior, who described the massacre as, quote, campaign of race extermination, end quote, in a telegram sent to the United States Department on the 16th of July, 1915. In his memoirs he completed during 1918, Mentegu wrote, quote, When the Turkish authorities gave the orders for these deportations, they were merely giving a death warrant to a whole race. They understood this well, and that in their conversation with me, they no made, made no particular attempt to conceal the fact. End quote. Their memoirs and reports vividly described the methods used by Ottoman forces and documented numerous instances of atrocities committed against the Christian minority. On the Middle Eastern Front, the British military was engaged fighting the Ottoman forces in southern Syria and Mesopotamia. British diplomat Gertrude Bell filed the following report after hearing the account from a captured Ottoman soldier. Quote, the battalion left Aleppo on the 3rd of February and reached Res Al Ali in 12 hours. Some 12,000 Armenians were concentrated under the guardianship of some 100 Kurds. These Kurds were called gender arms, but in reality were mere butchers. Bands of them were publicly ordered to take parties of Armenians of both sexes to various destinations, but had secret instructions to destroy the males, children, and old women. One of these gender arms confessed to killing a hundred Armenian men himself. The empty desert cisterns and caves were also filled with corpses. End quote. Winston Churchill described the massacres as quote, administrative holocaust end quote, and noted that the clearance of the race from Asia, Asia Minor was about as complete as such an act on a scale so great could well be. There is no reasonable doubt that this crime was planned and executed for political reasons. The opportunity presents itself for cleaning Turkish soil of a Christian race opposed to all Turkish ambitions, cherishing national ambition that could only be satisfied at the expense of Turkey and planted geographically between Turkish and Corsican Muslims. The Armenian Genocide is widely corroborated by international genocide scholars. The International Association of Genocide Scholars, IAGS, consisting of the world's foremost experts on genocide, unanimously passed a formal resolution affirming the factuality of the Armenian Genocide. According to the IAGS, quote, every book on comparative genocide studies in the English language contains a segment on Armenian Genocide. End quote. Leading texts in international law of genocide, such as William Shabazz's Genocide in the International Law, cite the Armenian Genocide as a precursor to the Holocaust and as a precedent for the law on crimes against humanity. Polish jurist Raphael Lemkin, when he coined the term genocide in 1943, cited the Turkish extermination of Armenians and the Nazi extermination of Jews as defining examples of what he meant by genocide. The feeling of Armenians in genocide, as defined by the 1948 United Nations Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crimes of Genocide, 126 leading scholars of the Holocaust, including Eli Weasel and Yonda Braw, placed a statement in you know, you know, the New York Times in June 2000 declaring, quote, the incontestable fact of the Armenian genocide, end quote, and urging Western democracies to acknowledge it. The Institute of the Holocaust Genocide, Jerusalem, and the Institute for the Study of Genocide, New York, New York City, had confirmed the historical fact of the Armenian genocide. 
historian Stefan Irig observes that the Armenian genocide was part of the prehistory of the Holocaust and that merely 10 years before Hitler's rise to power, the German debate on genocide began in 1919, concluded with justification of genocide and calls for the expulsion of Jews. A segment of speech given by Hitler to Weinmite commanders at Ossutelberg records him asking rhetorically, quote, who after all speaks today of the annihilation of the Armenians, end quote. Historian Margaret L. Anderson surmises, quote, we have no reason to doubt the remark is genuine, both attack and defence obscure and obviously reality, end quote, and that the, gen the Armenian genocide achieved iconic status as the apex of horrors imaginable in 1939 and that Hitler used it to persuade the German military that committing genocide excited a great deal of talk with no serious consequences for the nation that perpetrated the genocide. As a response to the continuing denial by the Turkish state, many activists from the Armenian diaspora communities have pushed for formal recognition of the Armenian genocide from various governments around the world. On the 4th of March 2010, a US congressional panel narrowly voted that incitement was indeed genocide. Within minutes, the Turkish government issued a statement critical of, quote, their resolution with accused the Turkish nation of a crime it had not committed, end quote. The, Arman, uh, the Armenian Assembly of America, AAA, and the Armenian National Committee of America, the ANCA, have as their main lobbying agenda to progress the Congress and President for an increase in economic aid for Armenia and a reduction of economic and military assistance for Turkey. The effects also include reaffirmation of genocide by Ottoman Turkey in 1915. 29 countries and 48 US states have adopted resolutions acknowledging the Armenian genocide as bona fide historical fact. As of 2017, Israel, the United Kingdom and the United States did not recognise what happened a century ago as genocide. Despite his previous public recognition and support of genocide bills, as well as election campaign promises to formally recognise the Armenian genocide, Barack Obama, throughout his two terms as US president, abstained from using the term genocide. In his 24th April 2016 commemoration statements, Obama referred to the Armenian genocide by his Armenian idiom, Mendez Yudur, spelled Yed Skuga in the statements. Despite a large number of direct descendants of the Armenian genocide living in, in Jerusalem, specifically in the Armenian quarter, Israel still refuses to acknowledge the genocide. Pope Francis described it as the first genocide of the 20th century, causing a diplomatic row with Turkey. The Bishop of Rome defended his pronouncement by saying it was his duty to honour the memory of innocent men, women and children who were senselessly murdered by the Ottoman Turks a hundred years before he came pontiff. He also called on all heads of state and international organisations to recognise, quote, the truth of what transpired and oppose such crimes without ceding to ambiguity or compromise, end quote. In resolution, the European Parliament commended the statement pronounced by the Pope and encouraged Turkey to recognise the genocide and so paved the way for, quote, genuine rec reconciliation between the Turkish and Armenian people. According to Kemal Simet, the head of the Armenian Research Group at the Turkish Historical Society, in Turkey there is no thesis on the Armenian issue. The Republic of Turkey's formal stance is that the deaths of Armenians during the relocation or deportation cannot aptly be deemed genocide, as a position has been supported with a plethora of intervergent justifications, that the killings were not deliberate or systematically orchestrated, that the killings were justified because Armenians posed a Russian sympathisation and threat as a cultural group, that the Armenians merely starved to death or any of a various characterizations referred to in Maudrin Armenian gangs. Some suggestions seek to invalidate the genocide on somatic or anachronistic grounds. 
Turkish World War I casualties figures are often cited to mitigate the effect of the number of Armenian dead. The premeditated destruction of objects of Armenian culture, religious, historical and communal heritage was yet another key purpose of both the genocide itself and the post-genocidal campaign of denial. Armenian churches and monasteries were destroyed or changed into mosques. Armenian cemeteries were flattened and in several cities, Armenian quarters were demolished. Aside from the deaths, Armenians lost their wealth and property without compensation. Businesses and farms were lost and all schools, churches, hospitals, orphanages, monasteries and graveyards became Turkish state property. In January 1916, the Ottoman Minister of Commerce and Agriculture issued a decree ordering all financial institutions operating with the empire's border to turn over Armenian assets to the government. It also recorded that as much as 6 million Turkish gold pounds were seized along with real property, cash, bank deposits and jewellery. The assets were then funneled to European banks. At the end of World War I, genocidal survivors tried to return and claim their former homes and assets, but were driven out by the Ankari government. In 1914, the Armenian Patriarch in Constantinople presented a list of Armenian holy sites under his supervision. The list contained 2,549 religious places, of which 200 were monasteries, while 1,600 were churches. In 1974, UNESCO stated that after 1923, out of the 913 Armenian historical monuments left in eastern Turkey, 464 had been vanished completely, 252 were in ruins, and 197 were in need of repair. According to the president of the IAGS, Henry Trothrillup, while current members of the Turkish society cannot be blamed morally for the destruction of Armenians, present-day Republic of Turkey, Turkey is a successor state to the Ottoman Empire and as a beneficiary of the wealth and land exploitations brought forth the genocide is responsible for repatriation. In 2007, the Armenian Genocidal Repatriation Study Group was formed with Talia as their chair, along with several other genocidal scholars. In March 2015, the group released a final report entitled Resolution with Justice, Repatriations for Gen Armenian Genocide. The report described the legal, historical, political and ethnic core aspects of Armenian genocide repatriations and proposed a comprehensive repatriations package for the victims. Over 135 memorials spread across 25 countries commemorate the Armenian genocide. In 1965, the fifth 50th anniversary of the genocide, a 24-hour pro mass protest was initiated in Shirovan demanding recognition of the Armenian genocide by Soviet authorities. A memorial was completed two years later of the, the gorge in Yevarian. The memorial contains 44 metres steel which symbolises the national rebirth of Armenians. Twelve slabs are positioned in a circle representing twelve lost provinces in present-day Turkey. At the centre of the circle there is an external eternal flame. Each 24th of April, hundreds of thousands of people walk to the monument, which is the official memorial of the genocide, and lay flowers around the eternal flame. The Armenian Genocidal Museum Institute, situated in Tezirakadaburg, presents a rich collection of books, archival material, demographic tables about the history of the Armenian Genocide, it also a research institute and library. The museum holds a permanent online temporary exhibition which gives a detailed documented description of what period and of the atrocities. Visits to the museum are part of the protocol of the Republic of Armenia. Many foreign dignitaries were ordered to visit the museum including Pope John Paul II, Pope Francis, President of the Russian Federation, Vladimir Putin, Presidents of France, Jacques Chirac and Francois Hollande and other well-known public and political figures. 
The museum is open to the public for guided tours in Armenian, Russian, English, French and German. The first artwork known to have been influenced by the Armenian genocide was a medal struck in St. Petersburg while the masses, curs and disputations of the 1915 were at their height. It was issued as a token of Russian sympathy for Armenian suffering. Since then, dozens of similar medals have been commissioned in various countries. Numerous eyewitness accounts of the atrocities were published, notably those of Swedish historian Armer Johansson and US Ambassador Henry Montagu the Senior. German medic Armin Wegner wrote several books about the atrocities he witnessed while stationed in the Ottoman Empire. Years later, having returned to Germany, Wegner was in prison for opposing Nazism and his books were burnt by the Nazis. Probably the best known literary work on the Armenian genocide is Franz Werfel's 1933 The Forty Days of Musa Da. This book was a bestseller that became particularly popular among the youth in the Jewish ghettos during the Nazi era. Kurt Ventog's 1988 novel Bluebeard features the Armenian genocide as an underlying theme. Other in novels include incorporating the Armenian genocide include Louis de Bairn's Birds Without Wings, Edgar Hauser's German language, The Story of the Last Thought, and Polish Stefan Zarinsky's 1925 The Spring to Come. A story in Edward St. Ivan's 2006 anthology The Black Knight's God includes a fictional survivor of the giant Armenian genocide. Thank you for listening to part two of the Brief History podcast, The Armenian Genocide. As always, please like, share, tell your friends, review, contact us on social media. It really does help. Thank you if you've already done so, and thank you in advance when you do. Please contact us on social media as we really do want to find out what you want us to record as the next episode, which we will release next week. Let me know your thoughts. Let me know what you thought about this episode also. Thank you once again for listening to the Brief History Podcast. I'm your host, Andrew Knight. Thank you. Bye. Get excited, America, because Dunkin' Go-To's are here. Double deals on breakfast sandwiches made for go-getters. Why two breakfast sandwiches? Well, maybe a co-worker eats one when you're not looking. Or maybe an eagle swoops down and steals one. Or maybe you're just double hungry. Whatever the reason, come into Dunkin' Donuts now and get two egg and cheese wake-up wraps for $2, two egg and cheese English muffins for $3, or two bacon egg and cheese croissants for $5. America runs on Dunkin'. Participation may vary. Limited time offer. Restrictions apply. Fly.